was started about February two years ago when Percy stood here and did a little talk about regenerative agriculture and then we started this group and we were all very interested in this to try and improve our soils and our grazing. With the changes in the country and the, and the lack of getting relatively cost-effective maintenance for our cattle, we've had to change the way we do cattle in this country to a large degree and uh, we have to rely more and more on our felt and, and uh, see how we can change our farming methods and to improve our soils. So what we thought we'd do today is um, we'd ask Mark possibly to start and then we talked about this. <laughs> Mark was very nearly late, so we're starting with Mark. <laughs> um, as you've all watched on our little group, Mark has gone and invested actually a lot of money into his little regenerative patch and, and, and on his farm there. So uh, he, he's a slightly different situation in that he's ploughed and he's got irrigation and so that's one aspect. And then John and Marie uh, down in Macheki have been doing the electric fencing. And then Yarp is going to focus more on the felt per se and, and, and what happens in the felt. There are uh, 18 copies of his talk. Yarpi, as usual, always does his homework. He's the teacher's pet. Thank, <laughs> thank goodness if, if he did it all, because otherwise there'd be nothing to take home. So there are some copies there. I'd also like to thank uh, Uchi from Nurture and Elliot from Nurture and Mark for uh, being able to film this today, so maybe more people can hear what we chat about than just us here. Uh, without any further ado, Mark, maybe you can just tell us why you started, what you've done. We've recently seen that lovely video uh, with how rich your felt looks there and hasn't been fertilized for two years, how you've got uh, free range laying hens, uh, you've got your little dairy and maybe you can mention what Percy's done there, uh, uh, trying to get adapted cows and then you've also got your your Boran cross heifers there and your Boran pear bed heifers there. So maybe you can just start off eh? First of all, thanks to Helen and Marie and the Mashona Society. As you see, I've come very well prepared. Um, <laughs> I'm going to steal your paper. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I, I'm terrible at paperwork. Everyone knows that. So what happened was Percy came and did some embryos and took some embryos out of Mashona, both at ourselves and Marie. And with having Percy there and having time, we, we got into the regenerative farming. Um, but Percy uh, sent me a, a, a couple of um, YouTube articles and uh, the one, mean names, the one by that, that, that lady who sort of tests all the soils and everything in New Zealand. And uh, I was watching this in the bath and I actually had tears in my eyes. And I said, I now have a future in farming because we got no land left, we've got 20 hectares of flay, what are we going to do with this flay? And uh, yeah, the, the regen gave me some hope that, that you don't need hectares and hectares and hectares of land to actually farm. So when Percy was there, we, we got into the dairy and embryos and everything and we walked down to this uh, 20 hectares of flay and we, we've only sort of um, regenerated so far, the one half of it. And basically what we've done is all with the livestock and, and followed basically Percy. So we haven't put a, we have tried, but it hasn't worked, but we, we've tried to seed our, our pasture with, um, with a Rome harrow. That, that really didn't work. We were very kindly lent a, a very fancy drill planter by Niels van Heden. That really didn't work, so we've gone back to spending no money, which is actually quite nice. So we just spending no money. We're just buying seed, collecting seed. I've got a couple of sacks. What we're doing in the, at the back there that everyone can look at. So we just collect seed. We we bought winter seeds. We have done that. Um, so we put some rye grass in and a lot of clover. The rye grass really can't get through the kukuyu. The kukuyu is about that thick of, of mulch now, so nothing really gets through except for the clover. Um, and I really think if anyone's going to do it in Zim, any, any of the legumes will really, really sort out your felt. Um, and you just, there are legumes for dry land, there are legumes for wetland, there's legumes for winter, 
legumes for summer. You just got to try it. You just got to get on and, and do it. Um, so we have done nothing to this pasture except we've tried to seed it in summer and try to seed it in winter. As you've heard, not very successfully. Um, and we've just irrigated it. So it's had no fertilizer, no land prep, no plowing, no nothing. So traditionally, we used to put 800 kgs of fertilizer on um, every year. For the last two years, we've done zero. And our pasture is looking healthier than it ever has. Um, things like spirobolus and that are, and I'm going to say unfortunately, are unfortunately now becoming less and less because they can't compete. Their seed, their seed can't germinate through all this mat of clover, stargrass, panicum. Um, they, it just can't germinate through it. So unfortunately, the, the, the spirobolus is getting less and less. And why I say unfortunately is because we've got a flay area and then a horrible laterite uh, area of about four hectares and the flay is the other seven. And the cattle always seem to like to go and sleep uphill and they all go and walk past the cuckoo and go and eat the sporobolus first. So do I plant more sporobolus? I don't know. But it is, it is naturally seeding, but I just don't think it's going to get through, it's gonna get through that, that mat of grass. Um, at, at the moment, we irrigate with the old laterals, so 18 meter spacing. So at the moment, I've, I've put rip lines down every 18 meters. And we plant in, we'll try and identify it. We plant in a, a type of barna grass that I found by, by Lake Chavera there. Very thick, broad leaf. Gets very tall, but when I've planted it in the veggie garden, it's, it's just, it's gonna be so much bulk. It's whether the cattle are gonna eat it or not. But it's, it's, it looks like a very, very bulky grass. Um, and every 18 meters, so we planted that five meters apart. Then in those lines, we plant in Moringa, Burkina, mulberries, and sort of anything else, a legume and that, the bush that's going to be a bit higher than the, than the star and the kukuyu. So that's presently what we're doing right now, is, is doing our irrigation lines. Um, and like I say, I bought a, a whole lot of seed there and everything that everyone can look at. Um, and I can, if we got time, I can explain how we put the seed onto this pasture just with a vicon. Um, we got our cattle crawl quite close, so we just go and get a whole lot of manure. I've got a, about a 10 mil sieve. We just sieve all the big pieces out so we know that the vicon's not going to get blocked. We sieve all the big pieces out, then we get as much seed as we can. We say, okay, we've got 50 kgs of ryegrass seed and we've got to do 11 hectares. And we just work out, I normally put on about 300 kgs of manure in 25 kg bags and then just mix all the seeds and everything into that manure mix it all up and then then it's uh, spread on with a vicon so that's how we spread the seed um, but you do need the the cow manure or something as a carrier whether you're going to use sand or or but cow manure is nice and light it's it's not hard on the equipment uh, the seed mixes in it easily so 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 that's how we we actually do the seeding um, and then on the dry land side, my son's put in center pivots. On the corners of the center pivots, on some of them he's gone regen. So the same again. Sorghum, sunflower, sun hemp, um, just normal flowers, marigolds and all that. We put in a two hectare patch. I think you all saw a video that, that it got right up to well over two, three meters, lab lab seed and everything in there. And then when we reaped it in winter, we just said, Reap everything you can. So on the edges of the contours, there was stargrass seed. There was amaranthus, bonongui seed. There was marigold seed. There was just everything. So you'll see a, a bag there. It looks very really rough. A lot of sun hemp seed, sunflower seed, uh, lab lab seed. We just told them to reap everything they could. Reaped it all, threw it in a bag. And that's what we're going to go and regenerate again with the rains. So you know, we found that, that you do need to import winter seeds and winter legumes but also there's a lot of our own natural stuff that you actually don't have to spend money on it's going to reap it use it you said that that red sorghum we've reached we've reaped about 300 kgs of natural panagum seed uh, that that reds that very sweet sweet sorghum we've reaped sweet sorghum that you you see growing amongst all the a1s maize and that and i think they use it for sugar sugar cane and my cattle foreman said to me our oh, boss you're 
you'll get seed the first year, but the second year you're not going to get any. So I said, why not? He says, oh, all the children will just eat it because it's so sweet. So, yeah, we just plant everything and anything that we can find. So, I don't know if anyone's got any questions, but um, all I can say is just do it. But legumes, legumes, sun hemp, uh, if I was doing dry land, we, so we plant in, we're probably going to try and do about 15, 20 hectares of sun hemp seed just to get the seed. And then we'll just go and spread it everywhere because that we know works in Zim. Uh, clovers, you need irrigated. Um, uh, this, the uh, Soratro, the silver leaf, all of that. Soratro up in more the sandier, dry areas. Silver leaf in the shade under the trees that does very well there um yeah so so we just looking around the bush and trying to find anything that we can that we can go and plant basically um i don't know if anyone has any questions confirm you've increased your stocking density on that area quite significantly yeah we we never really measured stocking density before but we've never had a healthier pasture than we have now even when we we're putting on fertilizer the vigor and the plants and everything. So the last video I think you saw, we had like there's 40 dairy cattle in there and Mashona crosses and everything in that in that 15 meter strip. And then the grass was just getting away. So because we're doing some AI work with the 2018s, we put the 2018s behind the, 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 behind the chickens and behind the dairy cattle just to try and get that grass down a bit more. But the beauty is I think 118 no, it's about 112, 112 heifers coming in every night, dropping all that dung that they picked up out there, dropping all that dung, all that urine. It's just just really, really good for the grass. Um, Doug asked me to talk on the chickens. Uh, we've, we started with 500 layers. It's a very hard learning curve. We've had quite a lot of, lot of deaths. Um, we're still trying to get it thing. We're still trying to get it taped. Jess incubates a whole lot of eggs for us, so we're crossing sasso chickens with high line now. It's actually quite a pretty chicken that comes out. <laughs> but uh, yeah, so we're trying to breed our own, our own sort of hardier chickens that we don't have to do vaccinations and all that. Um, but a figure to take home, I think, is 200 layers on a hectare of land over, over a year will give you 200 kgs of free nitrogen. So it's about 12 bags of AN free of charge and and that's what the american research shows you what what that what the dung will give you um they do they they scoff all nice little holes and everything in the in the soil and that's where you find some of your um, rye grasses and your winter stuff germinate in those in those areas that they've they've disturbed and all that um but i think and i think there is a a very good market for the eggs there's a good market for the eggs the, the dung they're putting down is, is free nitrogen. It's a natural nitrogen. Um, flies, if any flies gets in that uh, area that they're in, they just chase it down. They, they love flies. Um, I still can't get flies to, to breed in the chugubus that we put around because I think they just nail the adults before they even get a chance to go lay their eggs. Um, we got a lot of security lights, so we just sweep up all the ladybirds every morning around our house. They go down to the chickens. When the guy brings the eggs up, the, the ladybirds go down. Not the ladybirds, those rose beetles. Ro rose beetles just go, go down for food. Yeah. So just, just anything to try and save costs. On the chickens, I try to reduce the food. So I think a normal battery chicken, I might be corrected, but a normal battery chicken or layer eats about 130 to 140 grams of food a day. We're down to 100 grams of food a day. But we on about 70% of eggs production. Whereas I think those battery, battery birds are on about 90, 95%. But you will get a better price for your eggs. So, and then you've got to count the free nitrogen that you're getting also. So it's, it's, a, it's a whole lot of give and take. Um, I think also there's, we're going, to be, we're going to be looking at broilers. So I've just ordered a, a 200 sasso day olds. They're no, not sexed. So we did it once before, and then all the males, you just turn into broilers. All the males, you turn into broilers. Another, also another very good market for, for free-range broilers, free-range eggs. Um, you don't get a hugely, you might get 20% more than, than 
the urbans and and the the high the high line and all that you might get 20 percent more but you're getting more and more benefits for your soil your broilers you're not going to grow out in six weeks there's no chance you're going to grow them out in six weeks you're probably going to do it in eight to ten weeks but as i say you're just improving your soil all the time you're improving your pasture you're getting quite a good return and it's very satisfying when someone keeps phoning you and says when are you going to increase your chickens when are you going to get bring more eggs you know it's it's really satisfying that you you got stuff that people want um doug on the dairy i don't know how far you want to go um just tell us what you yeah so on the, on the dairy side, Percy brought in some embryos from New Zealand, uh, Kiwi cross embryos, some Jersey embryos, some Friesland. Well, the Friesland are still sitting in the flask because <laughs> none of us really like the big Friesland. So they're still f sitting in the flask. But I say that from Helena Mitchell because I think she's got pretty hardy Friesland. We got 12. Two died before we even got a drop of milk out of them. Um, the other 10 we've uh, inseminated with a bull called Nungamiri. Marie knows all about it. So, so Nungamiri is, is from Mashona embryos and Kiwi cross bull called Sovereign. Sovereign now has 400,000 daughters in New Zealand. So he's very well proven bull and it's not all about milk yield. It, it's more about what do they call it? No, no, they've got it. They, they, the New Zealanders uh, Measure a breed, they call it a breeding index or a, yeah. Value. Yeah, it's a dollar, basically a dollar, dollar index. It's your, your, your cheaper bull or your cheaper animal and a cow that's producing 80%, they measure everything because that's their biggest thing, 5,000, 5 million liters of milk a year. Um, and so they measure everything, everything. And everyone comes around once a month and measures the cow and measures the milk yield and measures, measures, measures. And um, they call it a breeding worth. So they'll tell you, they'll tell you how much the breeding worth is for, for that cow or that bull, and it's not about how many liters she gives you. It's her longevity, it's how much she eats, all that type of stuff. So Percy picked us some nice, small, adapted genetics for Zim, and we have now some lovely Friesland heifers, which are 50% Friesland, 25% Mashona. And 25% kiwi cross. And those are beautiful, slick coated, lo lovely heifers. I got a, a couple of videos of some of them, but we think for Zim there'll be a, a good market for those sort of animals. And they really look hardy, and they they, they look good. They look good. Um, so the dairy is just in the regen, least cost. Shame. It's it's least cost, least input. See how much milk we can get out of it. That we don't have to pour food into, don't have to pour a lot of antibiotics, um, and just trying to breed a more of an adapted animal for our environment, whether it's on the beef side, whether it's on the dairy side, whether it's on the chickens. We're just trying to breed an animal that we don't doesn't have to rely on. It's not oxy tetracycline reliant. It can actually try and live on its own and, and fight its own diseases. So that's sort of what we're trying to do. Uh, cheap and productive uh, that that's sort of our aim on the on the beef side you we we do a lot of night night dungas for the first year ever we've done lovely fire guards about 50 meters wide um, and the the cattle go in there at night and they just flatten everything finish everything and uh, we've had the least we've been able to control fires this year and we just go around the boundary 50 meters wide work out how many cattle we normally try and give them a, a square meter a night if there's 50 cattle in i don't know my math is not sorry it's not a square meter the mathematicians can work it out but if there's 50 cattle in there it's 50 meters wide by 50 meters down wherever your boundary line wants to go so so that that's how we sort of work it out we move it every night religiously this year i had a guy just parkland clearing any any trees there in that in that strip so he just parkland cleared took all the bottom branches off let the sunlight in so you can always you can sort of manage it you know they've done seven moves this week you can go back after week and see how much his parkland cleared so we haven't sent a roam harrow out we haven't sent a, a, a gang burning out we normally send about 12 people to go and burn fire guards water cart and it goes on for about three months this the cattle have done it all this year and once we've been around the perimeter 
if we want to cut a fire guard, we want to cut a fire guard in the middle, we just send them down the middle. So it's 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 saved us a lot of money and it's and it's stopped a lot of fires. So we we think that is a real real winner doing fire guards with your night dungas. We started it in about April. Started it in about April, but because we were because we yeah we on we leasing on seven different farms so. We actually couldn't get around. So if you could start earlier, you know, you can maybe start your fire guards a bit earlier. But just work out how how much you need to get around everywhere. Um, yeah, Doug, I don't know what else you want to do. Uh, That's fine, fine. Yeah. Any questions? Yeah. Mark, uh, Percy and Marie went around the farm. Um, I was quite proud of the way we'd managed our bush and grasslands in the farm and then Percy came back and he said sheesh you got a mess down in your flay by the time you did something about it so it was a big wake-up call for me anyway I'll, I'll give you a, a brief overview of what we're doing a lot of it is based on electric fencing and how we manage the paddocks that uh, that we do uh, the overview of the farm we we're 100 we're 407 hectares if you take away the arable areas, the residential areas, leaves us with about 150 hectares of grazing. That's the un, pretty much the unarable areas, non-arable areas. So at the moment, on the farm itself, we're running 360 head on 150 hectares of land. So that equals to about 2.4 animals per hectare which equals a grazing problem so we had to think about what we were doing um, Marie had read had followed up quite a bit with Percy and I think Doug as well about electric fencing and in a long long story short we ended up buying some electric fences um, we divided the We divided the grazing area into small blocks of about two or three hectares each. Uh, they're variable sizes. They're also very different shapes, so it's, it's difficult to get an exact block size. Um, we mow a line, a grass line, clear a glass line with a mowing machine. So that, that is easy for us to lay out our fences. Um, we run 40. 40 or 50 animals per two or three hectare block for two or three days and and we monitor the grass carefully within that block we want to keep the grass in the generative stage I don't want to flatten it I don't want to leave the sporobolus getting to the stage of where it's it's seeding or where the hyperenia is getting getting woody so we monitor it very very carefully our breeding cows heifers and young bulls are given priority with these paddocks because generally speaking they are the paddocks with the freshest and the most vigorous grass I'll break it down into summer and winter grazing because there's different different principles so uh, we're splitting up uh, the summer and the winter grazing um, our summer grazing plan is to graze with high density but short duration. Um, we monitor the grass sward very, very carefully um, as it's important in planning the move. So we try and move the cattle between two and three times a week on each block. So we've got four different electric fence blocks in various parts of the farm and we try and move them between two and three times a week depending on the grass. It's all about grass management in the summertime. Uh, the winter grazing is a bit different. We've got the pivot blocks with either barley or maize stover. Uh, we divide those up into two hectare blocks with electric fences and we graze them flat. Uh, we actually hammer them as much as we can. Um, the guidelines that we use for grazing in summer we try and keep the grass at the vegetative stage uh, and, and it's, it's a question of monitoring 
your grazing. In winter, it's based on maximum utilization of the crop residue. We want to get all that crop residue cleared out of the way, ready for the summer crops. In winter, we also supplement with barley hay. We take the hay off some of the lands. Um, we, we supplement with barley hay and sunflower cake. Um, in, in both cases, and I think it's a common theme with what Mark has said, it's hoof, dung, urine action. That's, that's what it's all about. It's getting the soil surface disturbed as much as possible. And it's all about monitoring. Pasture enhancement or improvements that we've done, um, it's an ongoing process. Since, since we introduced the cattle in 97, um, there were very few acacia or, or vaquilio on the farm. Now we have found in these last few years, we've seen an exponential increase in the Siberiana in, in and around the farm. Um, obviously the cattle eating the seed pods and distributing the seeds and they are germinating very, very well. Um, the trees provide good grazing underneath and the seed, a very good seed pod value. And looking at it recently, I think we're going to have to start thinning out the Siberianas this, this season because they are now in some areas starting to canopy, which is not a good thing. We've introduced legumes. We've got silver leaf, green leaf, incarnum, desmodium. Um, we've got fine stem stalo, lab lab. Um, we've spread them. These are put into the grazing areas, not into the uh, croplands. The green leaf and the silver leaf are self-seeding now and spreading very, very well. We, we're quite pleased with them. We've also used Lab Lab um, and I've got some funnies there. Uh, Velvet Bean is another one that we're going to throw in and see what happens. Our, our predominant grass species are, Parab are Sporobolus, Hyperenia, Bricaria, Panicum, and, and Broomgrass on the flays. Um, we've got some cat, Catambora lands. Um, those are our main grass species. Again, quite easy to monitor most of them. I'm also playing with a block, a small block of land um, where we've taken 17 different species of grasses and shrubs and weeds and whatever else, any seeds that we could find, and we've mixed them and sewn them together, and we'll see what happens to them, just out of a matter of interest. Some observations we've made, or results, uh, we're coming up to the third year with our electric fences now. We've got very good ground cover in our grazing areas. There is, there is a noticeable improvement. The grass reacted very, very quickly to the rain this year. We had a very thick ground cover. We had 38 mil in the first week of October. And it was amazing how the grass reacted. It, it came up and we've actually been able to graze it quite successfully with the fences twice already this year. Although now with the six weeks of drought that we've had or dry period that we've had um, we've had to open up the paddocks to make them bigger because the cattle are having to hunt for grass at the moment we noticed this area as well as something I've not seen before that some of the areas um, had green grass for the duration of winter it's not that it was growing but there was green there and this is the stuff as well that's reacted very very quickly and I think that's probably because the way we're doing things there's an increase in uh, subsoil moisture or soil moisture this last season um, our breeding herd stayed in particularly good condition and we were very pleased with the PD results so for us the electric fences are, are essential. We've got nine pivot blocks on the farm and all the grazing areas are little bits and pieces left over. 
I've taken two, two areas I've fenced off uh, just to see what happens with them. One of the blocks um, is, is a, a copse of trees. It's probably about two and a half, three hectares in extent. I want to see what happens when there's no cattle in there. And the other is a, is a big seep we've got on the farm in one of the flays. There's a lot of funny endemic bird species there that I don't want to chase off. So I've stopped the cattle going in there. And it'll be interesting to see what happens to them as well. But electric fences for us are essential. Um, there is improved grazing. Uh, we're finding the cattle are, are keeping their condition for longer. Um, in terms of management with the, with the cattle, it does entail one, one uh, tractor with a water cart and uh, his, the, the tractor driver and, and assistant's job is to, is to um, check that the, the water tanks are kept filled because a lot of these blocks don't have access to water. And this tractor driver... The tractor driver and his assistant are responsible for uh, the supplementary feeding of the cattle. So that's about all I've got. It's just a very basic overview of what we're doing. Doug? I want to say that I stand absolutely in awe of these people who are doing these wonderful things. They're opening up a, an altogether new world in the cattle industry. But the bulk of the cut country is still virgin felt. So I'm the primitive one. I'm just speaking about the felt. I remember in 1985, my wife and I went an, on an overseas tour. And when I came back, I said to the late Ian Delarue, I said, you know what? Far have I traveled and much have I seen, but there's nothing to beat our good old Shatin. <laughs> the felt is a, is a multi-species miracle with so many species. And so I'm dealing with a felt where there hasn't been a plow and there, there has, hasn't been a, a center pivot or anything, just the natural felt. Well, uh, I've attended many uh, uh, grazing management talks and three words stand out. They've been used so many times to introduce the talk. Cows graze selectively, therefore. And the whole felt management thinking for a very long time has been based on that word, therefore. Some people have put it another way. They've said that if you let cows loose in a paddock, They'll go for all the chocolates and they leave the rubbish. Now, that's a terrible indictment against the cow, and I'm going to come back to that. Now, in, in their thinking, uh, planning, felt management systems, they've been planning how can we force the cow not to graze selectively, and, and how can we prevent there being rubbish. Anyway, so all the years there have been the different systems, but then in the 1960s, this new system arose, they called short duration grazing, SDG. In the 1960s, it was in the vogue. It, was, it gained so much publicity, everybody was talking about it, and the Ministry of Agriculture chose a team of six people to monitor it. Now, I was very privileged to be one of those six. So I saw the thing right from close by and listened to all the arguments and visited the farms that were doing it 
and uh, and uh, and I was the meter reader because I did the PDs on those herds, and and the the PD tells you it's a very good meter reader. If the PD tells you where the things are good or okay or not so good, so well we 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 ran into problems with short duration grazing on the high felt the whole plateau of this country the high felt which is sour felt it didn't didn't go so well so there was a lot of debate and thinking what is it is it the intensity of the graze or is it the duration of the graze or is it the length of the rest? So Matopos did a very complex trial with 12 herds of cattle, of steers, on 96 paddocks. They were divided into three groups of four. The first group was four paddocks and uh, three, four sets of four paddocks. The next group was four sets of eight paddocks and the next group was four sets of twelve paddocks. Now the, they uh, put the herd of steers in the one set would spend one week in the paddock and move on and move on and move on. And the, the next herd would spend two weeks in the paddock and move on and move on and move on. And then the whole thing was duplicated so that the, 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 the other, uh, others were double stocked. The, the first lot was stocked at according to their calculated uh, carrying capacity of the felt and the others were stocked double that level. So you had Double stocking, the whole thing duplicated. In the four paddocks, in the, uh, in the eight paddocks, and in the twelve paddocks. So that that experiment measured so many things. The intensity of graze, the duration of graze, the length of the rest, and, and the, how heavily they were stocked. Now... The steers that did the very best were those where the felt rested the shortest. Three weeks, four paddocks, one week, one week, one week. Three weeks, they back again. They did the best. And then, interestingly, those that were double stocked, doing the same thing at double the stocking rate, did almost as well as the top ones. There was very little difference. But going the other way, where the, 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 the rests were the longest in the 12 paddocks, uh, two weeks, two weeks, two weeks, meant over five months rest. Well, those stocked at the conventional level were very poor. But those stocked at double that were poverty stricken. So there you have on exactly the same felt ranging from very good performance to poverty stricken just from the way you graze just from the matter of rest or intensity of graze or whatever so that trial uh, told uh, 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 so, uh, expressed a whole lot of solutions or indications of uh, what is good and what is not good. Strangely, uh, that experiment was not given much publicity and strangely, the grazing people didn't take much notice of it. Right. So, uh, in the decades that followed, uh, there was more and more emphasis on, on uh, high grazing intensity, short duration, 
and long rests. Exactly the opposite that was indicated by the, that experiment. But then they started noticing that there is a benefit with crowding the cattle like this because they are trampling everything into litter and of course there is all the dung deposition and so on and the hoof action and there is definitely an indication of improvement of the soil. So that turned this thing into almost a philosophy that you could follow with a passion. Well, uh, then the media started warning about global warming, about climate change, and uh, so now the cow was really in the dock. And then when they started talking about carbon dioxide and methane, the, it seemed as if the only hope was to regiment these cows into that uh, uh, regeneration patrol. And there e even came the thought that uh, maybe we're too late. Can we see this is now to save planet Earth? Maybe we're too late. Well, that is how things went. Now, allow me now. It's my innings. I now want to bat for the cow. The cow's taken the blame for all this. And let's go back to the chocolate story. Now that chocolate story crea creates a bit of a wrong impression. It isn't as simple as that chocolate and rubbish. If it was so simple, we would, would not have more than 500 species of grass left in the country. But we have this wonderful diversity of grass. There must be some buffer system that has preserved diversity. So, the rubbish, there's only one rubbish in the felt nutritionally, and that is lignin. That is the rubbish. All the other grass is chocolates of different grades. But, do you know, it's over our whole plateau of this country. We have vigorous grasses that, uh, certain species of vigorous grasses that lignify early. That's why one calls them sour. Within a few weeks of the start of the growing season, they start turning into lignin. There's thatching grass. There's broom grass, there's russet grass, there's parabolus. And as soon as they've turned into lignin, then they are rubbish nutritionally. Of course, they're not rubbish if you're selling, uh, selling thatching grass or if you're manufacturing brooms, then they aren't rubbish. But nutritionally, for the cattle, they are rubbish. But now I want to tell you the very most important grass fact pertaining to the felt, to the felt. The most important grass fact. In that pre-lignin state, before they become lignin, they are top grade chocolate. The very best chocolate. And they are the very first preference of the cows grazing. They will graze broom grass, they will graze russet grass, which incidentally in Afrikaans is called koper, draad, gras, copper, wire, grass. <laughs> and, and they will graze spirobolus. They will graze it before they even look at panicum or any of the other sweet grasses. They will graze those grasses. And as long as they can keep those grasses short, that is their preferred grazing right through the whole growing season. That is what gives you maximum summer weight gains. That is what gives you uh, maximum uh, fertility. 
Now, uh, you, you may uh, ask me to prove that. Well, I know one man, one, one rancher who for fi five years now, he's averaged over 95% conception rate on pre-lignin thatching grass. Then, uh, uh, the, oh, there are so many other examples. I, I won't, but believe me, that is the, that is the most valuable production of the felt is the pre-lignin sour grass. But now there's another big advantage, and this is the wonderful buffer that has saved, preserved all the diversity in the felt. And that is, while they are grazing that grass short, all the sweeter grasses are, are getting away and maturing to provide their winter contribution of maintenance chocolates. So, so the sweet grasses are getting their rest. Now you may ask, but doesn't the sour grass need a rest? Well, everyone will say, of course they need a rest. But now I ask you to judge. If you let them rest, they straight away go into lignin. And nothing will eat them. And if they stand in that state for one season, they start going moribund. So what does the rest help them? But rest sweet grass, it grows, it produces seed, it reproduces itself, and it gives you winter grazing. Look, I'm, I'm not... I'm not criticizing these people who are doing a wonderful thing in altogether different circumstances. But when you come to the natural felt, this is a, a primary rule. Now you'll say, well, what do you then do with that grass that is lignified? What do you do with it? Now, here's a very important thing. After midsummer, when when the area they've been grazing short, as the growth rate is getting, the the grazing rate is now getting on top of the growth rate, and the, you know, they're grazing that down to the ground, which doesn't do it any harm. But at that stage, while this other lignified grass is still green. If you put a mower into it, you know you're turning the lignin rubbish into top grade chocolate again. And all the areas of, of that grass that you then cut, you, you're adding to the diet of these cattle. And you're actually extending their summer gains. Then, uh, in the dry season, when they are dry, then you can do what you like with them. Then you can parade the cattle on them for as long as you feed the cattle because it isn't food when you push cattle on, 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 on to lignin. It isn't food. Right. Now, there's another thing. With this ultra-high density, short-duration grazing, what are you doing? With your intensive rest, intensive graze and long rest, you're creating lignin. In the top, in, the, in our eye felt where, where the, the sour grasses are dominating, you're creating lignin. And then the cattle go and they trample it into the ground and so on. And, and then what you do then? You're then giving it another long rest so that when you come back there, you, it's lignin again. So you're actually perpetuating lignin. So there isn't any logic to that. Now, there's another thing. This thing of uh, the cow being 
being uh, held guilty for felt degradation and desertification because of its grazing habits, I want to say this, that the farm I grew up on, my folks moved on to it when I was one year old. And when we were chased off it, I was 71 years old. And my whole life, I've been interested in cattle and following it. In my youth, my father was ordered to destock the farm because it had too many cattle, 300. In the last few decades, that farm carried 600 cattle. So much bigger and so much better. And not only that farm, all the other farms. And all that time they were grazed free range. And so free range cows, the, that animal input impact improves the felt. It doesn't degrade it, it improves it. So <coughs> there's nothing wrong with a cow's habit of grazing. Now, one may think, well, what about the communal lands? Look what they look like. It's not the cow's grazing habit that does that. It's other factors that do that. And, and then uh, they, they often not as degraded as one thinks. I know on central estates, the, the, they, they, all their staff lived on, on the, on the Kwekwe Nguma Road. That was, that was a TTL, a proper TTL, just like you see any other. And then in 1960, they moved them all away and, and surveyed that block into ranches. And I did PDs on those ranches. I remember Jock Kraling, he was an ex-Connex man. He bought Parati Ranch. And I couldn't believe my eyes how well those cattle did on that TTL felt that was just given a chance to get away. Wonderful. And, other, and I have other examples. Because it's grazed short to the ground, especially the sand felt TTLs, uh, I've got a dense cover of kutch grass. You don't see it. But just give it a chance and, and there it is, ready to produce. So it hasn't been degraded. The, the problems in the communal lands, a lot of the problems are, 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 are erosion from the paths the cattle walk every day to the crawl and back and down slopes and, and the scotch carts and so on. You get a lot of erosion there. Our communal lands in this country were, 50 years ago, they were probably the best in Africa as far as conservation uh, work is done. I remember uh, Chilabanzi TTL was a showpiece. All the contours and all the proportions. But lately, discipline has disintegrated and, and now you're getting erosion everywhere. Anyway, what I want to say is the whole emphasis is on dung deposition and hoof action. And this, this lignin parade going through the, through the farm is trampling, trampling, trampling lignin into the ground. But what does the cow do when she has a choice to graze as she wants? During the summer months, they will be grazing that top grade chocolate, keeping it short, and all the dung and hoof action will be concentrated where it is working, where you have the biological cycle in full swing. And, and, uh, and that's in the summer months when, 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 when the grass is growing. Now, another thing is this, that they also, in the dry season, 
They go to the trees that are dropping pods. They visit those trees every day. So every day, probably 120 times in the, in the season, cattle go to those pot-bearing trees. Acacia, sea banana, and so on. Think how much hoof action and dung deposition they fertilize those trees that are, are giving that wonderful winter fruit to the cattle. And then that dung doesn't just only uh, uh, bring nutrition to the soil, it's also a sower of seed. And the first seed they sow under these trees is panicum. And panicum is a wonderfully productive uh, grass for winter grazing, not for summer grazing. Very productive. It will give you quite a few tons per hectare. Right. Now, winter comes, now cattle go start going to the trees. In summer they won't go near those trees and that grass will grow without any disturbance. In winter they'll go and they'll grow and they'll, their diet will be panicum plus acacia pods. Wonderful diet. So, the, the, the cows' grazing habits are not to be blamed for desertification and for degradation and for quite a few other things. Right. Now, there's just one thing I still want to say. And there are actually many things I would like to say, but uh, it's, uh, time is now running out. One thing I want to say, we hear that, oh, but of course, you can, you can double the number of cattle you carry. Can you? That Matopa's experiment showed you that as you get, as you get longer rests and more intensive grace, the, 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 the increase in numbers is is more damaging because it's all lignin, it isn't food. The, the very most productive part of the felt, your, your, your sour grasses, has been abandoned to become lignin litter. Whereas those are really the backbone of carrying capacity. So you can't carry more cattle. But you can with state stocking, you can because on average, on average years, at the conventional stocking rate, the cows usually keep about half of the area of sour grass short, and the other they can't cope with, they leave it. You double the, you double the number of cattle, and it means they then keep the whole area short and if you haven't changed their the summer diet one iota. So you, you, you are much more uh, potential for increasing numbers with free-range grazing. And I've seen many cases of increased numbers of free-range grazing. Now look, I'm not just sucking these things with my th from my thumb, I've been doing thousands and thousands of PDs on ranches. This is ranches that haven't got centre pivots or ploughs or anything on, on the felt that are on this short duration grazing. Whether you call it holistic or whether you call it the other, that's just terminology. But the 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 cattle performance has been so poor that you almost feel you want to call the SPCA to come and have a look. That's the spe experience that I'm having and, and, and it, it's, it's my duty to try and bring a bit of logic and to, to give a bit of advice but, but I'm telling you that advice is not taken. It's simply not taken. People have 
a passion over this, and it's good to have a passion. I have a passion over cattle. It's good to have a passion. These people are, who are doing a wonderful thing that they told us today, they have a passion over it, and that's right. They must have a passion. I think I've spoken enough. Thank you. With that short duration grazing, I said I was the meter reader. I had to do, uh, and I, I did thousands of, uh, of uh, PDs and monitored all the factors, stocking rate, breed, breed type of pelt, etc., etc. And I did a paper which was published in the Rhodesian Agricultural Journal. And uh, this is the paper. If it's to spare, you can have it, whoever will will Mine. photocopy it for <laughs> someone else. Right. Anyone wants a copy of it? I just want to tell you that in 1971, the, 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 the veterinary uh, profession had a congress and they decided to, to uh, allocate a whole morning to felt management. So, so important was the matter. And at, at that, I gave this paper. And after me, Alan Savory spoke, and other people spoke, and other people spoke. And, and the, uh, Professor Hofmeyer, the Dean of the Veterinary Faculty at Onderstepoort, was in attendance. And he came to me afterwards and congratulated me and suggested that I pursue a PhD on the subject but I've pursued many other things I haven't pursued <laughs> a PhD. Now, that's that. I wanted to show you that. Well, this, and this is Boudere in South Africa, 1945. It tells you of a nine-year trial to see whether sour felt, this is what I wanted to mention, whether sour felt needs a bit of a rest to keep up its vigor, uh, rest during the growing season. So, so uh, they did the heavy grazing with steers, but one set of paddocks the, uh, got two or three weeks rest just to let the sour grass get away. Do you know that the sour grass that had no rest was heavily grazed for nine years, it was still outperforming the other by 30%. So the question whether sow felt needs rest. That's what I wanted to tell you. Thank you. Some of the best responses that uh, the PDs I've had are on farms where the person has continually grazed and the cattle have uh, kept the felt short in areas where they require to keep it short. And I can tell you from my limited observation going there afterwards to see where they got achieved this performance, I did not see any major damage uh, to that felt. So one of the best systems I've seen practically is a two paddock system where the animals will graze through the summer, the other paddock is completely rested until such time in around May, then his seed on that sour felt is ready to drop. Then once there's been seed drop, you transfer the herd there and they stay the entire year there and then you swing back to the other herd. And that seed drop and that trampling that goes through winter up and then through summer uh, uh, allows that to reseed. And, and that I've seen a bloke probably getting over 90, closer to 95% for four years in a row. That herd was moved and it went to another area. The herd that remained under different management until management started getting a bit slack was over 90% for another three years. Where that herd went again, we had done certain things to select for fertility and early maturity. That herd has continued to do over 95% uh, most years. So it is achievable. And I, can, I think one of the things we miss is this question of uh, lignification. We, when we do these high pressure systems and we move the cattle and we give the area a rest, yes, there is more grass. There is more dense grass. But because it's lignified, if you don't supplement those cattle to make up the difference between that, what that uh, grass is in, in deficient, in other words, you have to supply protein and energy, 
you will not get the PDs. So those folks that have been doing this, and we, we need to do the PDs, and we need to understand that you have to make up that nutritional deficit. Otherwise, you are not going to achieve your PDs. And if you don't achieve your PDs, you do not achieve your financial requirements. And you are going to struggle. So um, I'm very chuffed that Yapi has come here today uh, to tell us. And just tell, uh, the main thing is about this lignification. And I think we need to understand that. I think all of us want to do something with uh, regeneration. And I'll just tell you what I'm trying to do. I'm doing it in my garden, and BVG has got a three-year uh, contract at Art Farm with 24 hectares there, and we're going to be doing various little things there with pigs and sheep and hopefully some dairy cows. One of the things, uh, I, I go back to Gabe Brown's five principles. Don't let the soil get exposed. By keeping it covered, you're reducing that temperature there, you're evening out the soil temperature, and you're stopping evaporation and heat coming off that soil. So that's number one. Keep the soil covered. Do not damage the soil as in any way if you, can, if you can help it. If you start putting holes in it and turning it, you're releasing carbon, and you're undoing that zoo of animals and insects and things that are under the ground. You want to try and maintain the, the, the farm underneath the, so the soil surface. So you want to try and feed those organisms. So the third thing is constantly try and have roots in the soil. So don't pull things out. Rather cut them so those roots are in the soil. When they die and generate, those roots become carbon. And there are also ways for fungi and moisture to get down deeper into that soil. So keep roots in the soil. And then create diversity. So what Mark's done is he's planted all sorts of seeds in the ground. In this country, we only really have three months, maybe four months, where things would grow. Very few of us are actually planting things in our gardens or in, in the felt. And I think that's where we need to be more proactive. We just stopped on the way out um, to Norton to look at Marks and Coney cattle. And in the island uh, on the highway there, there is Sorotra growing everywhere between the two roads. It is the seed, it's just growing everywhere. And I think what, what we've done over the years is we've, we've got rid of a lot of the legumes and the protein in the felt. And we, our objective really, because in winter we're supplementing protein, and it works out at about 10 US dollars a percentage point protein replenishment, uh, replacement. So if we can try and increase the protein yield of our felt with legumes and with, um, with acacia trees and their pods, then we are going to reduce our, our winter maintenance, which really is the whole thing, is to reduce our winter maintenance. So if in that short three to four month growing period, we can try and get more proteinaceous uh, plants growing in the felt, then all the, bet all the better. So I think if you want to go home today, what, think about what you're going to do. This is the start of the season. You've got three months to do something. What are you going to do? So that, I think, is really the discussion. John's got seed. Mark's been collecting seed. We've got, we've got our Fumfuzo plot out here. We've got Sorotra growing up the fence here. We've got vet seed we've collected. We all are transplanting seeds everywhere and whatever we can to see how well they do. So that's what I'm doing. And Yopi, I, I, I can just reiterate as a vet and young James here, who's back as a vet, we, we do the PDs and we know that if you don't get decent PDs, you're not going to be in business for long. And... Uh, this lignification uh, story is the real issue. Grasses lignify so that they can put up their seed heads, so that they can protect their seed. So it's a protective mechanism, so that they can then regenerate. But if you, but as you are saying, the the sour felt, they don't always need seed to regenerate. They can do it through stolons and other ways. So they are not they are not uh, completely messed up. I think Mark's breaking my table. Okay, any more questions? No, uh, just one thing. When you, when you buy these uh, pasture grasses, um, and for instance, Percy sends us pictures of his nice bulk grass, those grasses don't lignify. So if you give them increased rest, you increase your bulk, 
but that bulk nutritional value is pretty much the same as when it's short. So as they grow, yes, you do want more bulk. But our sour grasses are different. They lignify or they give up certain turpentines and that to protect them. So when you're planting rye grass and you're planting some of those foreign grasses and, 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 and um, uh, what's the one from Kenya? Uh, cuckoo and things like that. You want that longer rest because that's going to give you more bulk and more food. But with our grasses that lignify, it's not the same process. You need to keep them really short. So we know that going through to maintain your body condition between three and three and a half or between two and three quarters and three and a half body condition score, you know what, what percentage protein needs to be there. So if we know that and we know that, for instance, that Cibarana seeds give you 16% ground up, we know that that can, can carry you and can carry milking cows, etc. And it can carry so much, can carry dry cows. So we know what they need to receive through the year. And then we need to try and say, well, what, what kind of felt do we put in front of them? So, yes, we can manipulate that. And, of course, you can buy supplements and you can, you can achieve it like that. But how can you do it with three or four months of rain, plant the stuff so that it's either pods which is delayed or how do you produce protein that's now in summer or protein, say, through the autumn period? Through, through some of your legumes and things like that. So I think that's the kind of thing we need to sit and plot our fodder flow a bit more carefully through the year. You know, if it's really wet, you know that when things are really wet, we know as vets you get a lot of coccidiosis and those kind of things and wet navel so you have high mortalities. So there's like a little window where you don't want to have to feed lactating cows too early Otherwise, you've got to provide for silage and things like that. So it's quite a narrow window from around about uh, October, November, uh, December when you want them to calf. Yes, you might forfeit a bit on weaning weights, but then the cows get the green at around about the peak when they're at peak lactation t between two and a half, three months. So when there's nice grain felt. So the timing of such is, is quite important now. When we're relying more on felt than crop residues than we have in the past. Yeah. Yeah, I want to ask you, um, Miyopi. So, in general, we've got you've got the Miombo on the plateau. Miombo is a little climax dominant vegetation, and it goes to Hyperenia. You talk about plant succession without grazing animals or without a high impact of grazing animals. It goes to Hyperenia grasses and and trees. However, on the other extreme, if you have what we had in the communal lands were uh, very overstocked because of people pressure, uh, too little land, and also uh, cropping. Then you end up with cooch, pinga, okay? And that's very good in terms of holding the soil because it's very, the cover's good. So it's good in that term, but it's, it's not, it's, and it's very nutritious, but it doesn't give you the bulk. So you've got that somewhere in between, you need to try and manage your felt in your set stocking system. Because when I'm in the tobacco area, a lot of guys didn't, so from early days I leased a lot of farms from people who didn't want cattle. And you'd move on to the farm, we'd have hyperenia grass, and within a few years of being on that farm, paddocks and everything, the hyperenia would disappear. It was like the cattle love it and they seem to, it seemed to disappear. How we know is we've also got large labor forces who need hay, I mean not hay, sorry, thatch, as part of their requirement for building and kitchens and stuff. So, and you start sending the tractor further and further to eat for thatch. So, Hyperenia is a great cross when it's young, as we know, and, when it, and, it, and it gives you a lot of production. But you don't want it, you don't want it disappearing. And so, how do you manage, how do you stabilize? Where do you, do you know what I mean? How do you measure, what is your optimum? That is the difficult thing, being all the years that I've been, you know, you don't want to overstock it, you don't want to understock it, but you want to get it right. You want to over change the species or no, no, I know there's buffers. I know but a high perennial for example in my case did disappear on all the farms that I grazed. Yeah, that I think that's sad when the high perennial disappears and I think it's something one needs to monitor and if you're seeing it happen then that's when you give a paddock a rest, I think. Unless the situation is that all the hyperineas 
being cut off all the time for making for thatching purposes and so that it doesn't get a chance to get away I, I don't know yeah I, I'm actually surprised but uh, but it's sad if if it disappears and I think but I think you can uh, stop it by giving the paddock a break maybe okay any more questions you can we'll be around and hopefully go and have some tea so we can all chat okay thank you very much for attending Thank you. Like there's there's seed, seed and everything everyone can look at out there. Yeah. Just what we've collected. Thank you all for coming. Uh, thank you.